Good afternoon, everybody. I'm making this short, hopefully concise and clear presentation on Hinduism so that we can keep the ball rolling since we can no longer meet in person in my Eastern philosophy class. So in talking about Hinduism, we right off the bat run into certain challenges because we are talking about the oldest living religion on the planet. In fact, some people would even question whether it is a religion because it is so deeply metaphysical. But we've already talked about that. That distinction between philosophy and religion is less clear in the East. And that's because philosophies, like the Hindu metaphysical system, are religious in nature because they have as their goal the direct mystical experience of reality itself. And that is religious that is intensely spiritual. It's complicated to sort of hand over in any kind of a tidy package because there's no church authority, there's no central figure like Jesus or Mohammed, there's no central institution or any kind of centralized doctrines to cling to. It has morphed, it has adapted to all of the changes in this subcontinent called India in all of the years that it's been adapting and resisting all attempts at evangelical conversion, you know, as different, more institutionalized religions moved into the country. It has resisted all of that. It has been able to adapt and morph into different subsystems that we now in the West call Hinduism, an expression many Hindus haven't even heard, by the way. And so this philosophy slash religion is as old as the ancient uh, Egyptian systems of thought, but this system is still in existence today. And it's um, difficult to make succinct. And so my attempt at doing that is such that I focus on the metaphysical beliefs that are common to all of these individual practices. And those metaphysical traditions I've captured in these Sanskrit expressions, and I'll use these as a jumping off point. Pantheism, Brahman, Atman, Maya, Avidya, Samsara, Karma, and Moksha. I have on there as well the word yoga and sadhu. We'll see how far we get. Well, Starting with pantheism, it's a Western word, but it captures the sense of everything is divine. All of nature is divine. Everything is God. There's no God that's separate from us. Everything is God, meaning you're God and I'm God. And my doggie over there is God. My two doggies over there is God. My tortoise is God and my two sycamore trees are God. And the river, which is running crazy today with all of this rain, is God, and the mountains are God. Everything is God. You're it, I'm, I'm it. And that's why we end all yoga classes with satnam or namaste, meaning I bow to that divine spark within you. And when you say it back, you're saying, I bow to that divine spark within you too. There have been Western pantheists like the Jewish philosopher Benedict Spinoza, but Hinduism is one of those teachings which as a whole tend to be pantheistic in their viewpoint that everything is God and there's no distinction between that which is God and that which is not God. All of nature is God. And so with that said, what is God? Well, that brings us to our next word, Brahman. Brahman has no sensible definition because the minute you try to say what it is not, you have at that moment limited it. And this is something which has no beginning and has no end. There's nothing that it is not, hence the Hindu expression, not this, not that. There's nothing that's not it. Everything is Brahman. Brahman is that eternal, limitless, divine reality that we all are. And as long as I am embodied, I carry a spark of that within me. And that's Atman, sometimes translated as soul, but that's just as problematic as God. Brahman and Atman are the same thing. That's what the Upanishads, those Hindu scriptures teach us. Those scriptures teach us this metaphysical reality that 
Atman and Brahman are one. And Atman is that within me that is eternal. In other words, I'm not this body. I'm not this temporary identity that I call Donna, or that you all sometimes call Professor Quesada. I'm not that. I'm just this spirit that really has no birth and has no death. And so there's nothing to fear. It lives on. It just merges with Brahman like a wave taking temporary identity as a wave saying, look at me, I have a perfect curl, but I'm not this wave. I will crash back into the ocean and that's like my soul crashing or merging back into Brahman. And there was never any distinction to begin with. The belief that there was, back to our list, is Maya. It's like a spell has been cast over me. That spell is called Maya. And my task, as, li as long as I am born into this human form, is to break free of that spell and to realize that I'm not this body. I'm not this temporary identity. I am God. So continuing on, how do I break free of Maya? And I want to emphasize how different this is than the Western traditions. In the West, we are so often in this head space of needing to be good so as to get into heaven. But in the Hindu religion, it's not so much a theology, it's not so much an ethical system, it's not so much a system of purification so that if you act perfect, then you'll be somehow forgiven or admitted entrance into heaven. That's not the story in place here. That's not the metaphysical story. The idea is a total transformation of my consciousness so that I awaken to the reality that I am part of this divine essence, this pantheistic reality that I'm a part of called Brahman, that I'm a part of this eternal, this universal spirit that is beyond time and space, that is beyond beginning and end, that is beyond the limitations of you and me as a separate self, to realize that I am that. So it's not a system of ethics, it's not about making you perfect, because perfect conduct could never be sufficient. It's about waking up. It's about a transformation of my consciousness. And that takes several lifetimes. For the yogis, it takes 84,000 lifetimes. Why? Because we're lazy, because we're fearful, because we're attached. It doesn't make us bad. It's not about whether we're bad or good. It's about breaking free of those samskaras that we call deeply imprinted habit patterns. Because as long as I'm under the spell of Maya, then I'm attached to this body. I'm attached to this material life. I'm attached to youth. I'm attached to my stuff. I'm attached to my money. I'm attached to other people. I'm attached to my reputation. I'm attached to getting accolades. I'm attached to things going the way I think they ought to go. But as soon as I wake up, then I realize that there's nothing to attach to because all of these things I thought were real aren't really so real. And that's all part of Maya, the delusion called Maya related to the English word magic. It's like someone has cast a spell on us. And it's like this play. There's a word for that too, Leela. This play is nothing but an illusion. And so my task, my dharma in this lifetime is to wake up to the fact that I'm not what I thought I was. I am spirit. Breaking the spell of Maya, breaking out of the spell, breaking out of the idea of the separate self takes many lifetimes and that brings us to the notion of reincarnation 84,000 lifetimes that's quite a ride to the Hindus it's imagined as this cycle I think of it as a ride you, do you remember those rides at amusement parks when you were a kid and they would go around and around that's how it is life and death life and death life and death life Time is cyclical. You go around and around and around and life is fraught with these challenges. 
lessons to be learned, the lesson of forgiveness, the lesson of love, how to overcome fears, how to overcome all of the challenges that make life so difficult when things don't go our way, disappointments and heartbreak and of course losing the ones we love. There comes a point where you say, get me off this ride. I didn't like those round and round rides when I was a kid. You just want to scream, get me off this thing. Well, to the Hindu way of looking at things, that's how it is. The idea isn't to be attached to life. They're very realistic about it. The idea is that life is full of challenges and the task here is to wake up and it takes many lifetimes to do that. And so around and around we go. And that process of going around and around, life and death, life and death, life and death, is called samsara. And so the task becomes getting off the ride. In other words, liberation of the cycle of samsara. In other words, breaking free of the need to come back again. In other words, learning your lessons once and for all so that you don't need to come back and evolve. In other words, waking up to the reality that you are spirit, I am spirit. We all are part of the one. Waking up to that, to that transcendent consciousness called Brahman. In other words, self-realization. In other words, get me off this ride. And that word for breaking free from samsara once and for all is called moksha, liberation. Sometimes the A is dropped from these Sanskrit words, moksha. And back to our list. So breaking free from samsara is moksha. And that whole process is driven by karma. We sometimes contaminate that with our Western ideas of punishment. It's not punishment. It's liberating. Karma is nothing but cause and effect. Cause and effect. For every action, there is a reaction. And I and you, we all have the freedom to create, to take responsibility for the choices we make every day and to walk that yogic path toward self-realization, toward moksha. And so it's liberating. It's not limiting. Karma is that process that drives the wheel of samsara. By karma, my rebirths will be determined. It's me, it is I who determine my next rebirth. How liberating is that? It means there's no one in the sky punishing me or limiting me to some sort of life that I don't self-direct. I am the creator of my life. I am divine. I have that creative force within me to wake up or not, to wake up or go back to bed metaphorically and literally. And so it is karma that drives that process of samsaric rebirth. And it is I who have the power to wake up, even within this very lifetime. The process of waking up is moksha. And I can wake up right here and right now. And that's samadhi. That's the doorway, the portal that opens up that limitless, sense of knowledge and it's a very special kind of knowledge it's a deep knowing knowing within my cells that i am that i am divine i am brahman there's no distinction between atman and brahman and that's all yoga does yoga is the path that i walk to wake up